It is such a joy and just tremendous honor uh, to be with you all. I graduated almost 18 years ago. Um, I was 12 when I graduated. <laughs> I was the youngest graduate ever of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. <laughs> and since I graduated, uh, I hadn't really uh, heard from Ted's since then, which is fine. But I'd kind of been hoping that I'd have the opportunity one day to come back to TED's, to come home. So in the meanwhile, um, I've been speaking at other schools, RTS, Gordon-Conwell, Covenant, Westminster, etc. I actually spoke at Westminster three times. Uh, and the third time, the title of my chapel talk was, as I was eagerly awaiting an invitation to speak at TED's, was why I didn't go to Westminster Theological Seminary. <laughs> that was um, the last time I was ever invited to speak at <laughs> Westminster Theological Seminary. And then there was my uh, chapel talk at, at Covenant Seminary. I spoke on why I didn't go to Covenant Seminary as I eagerly awaited an invitation to speak at my alma mater. And now here I am. Thank you, Dr. Dockery. Uh, so my talk today uh, is titled, Why I Went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Well, not, not really, um, but I won't be entirely surprised or opposed if the marketing department tweaks the title of my talk online. Uh, when I was considering where to go for seminary, um, Westminster Theological Seminary was super close to where my wife and I were living, just five minutes. Um, at the time, my wife Pearl and I were teaching in the public schools, um, thoroughly in enjoying the very noble pursuit and enjoyment of long summer vacations. And one day, I turned to my wife and I said, hey, want to go over spring break to visit my sister Tina at TED's and check it out? Um, I had just recently had a God moment while watching a movie called Searching for Bobby Fischer. And I had determined to never again make a decision based on fear after watching that mov movie. And that really, in many ways, opened up a lot more possibilities in my life than I naturally would have considered. Um, on our drive out to TED's, we experienced a tornado warning, flash flood warning, rain, hail, f frost, sleet, and snow. All. We stayed at a uh, guest apartment on campus while we were visiting. We're woken up by Canadian geese honky at, honking at 5 a.m. and defying every reasonable instinct in my body, telling me to run away. I thought to myself, I love this place. I remember visiting the missions office and seeing this older gentleman walk by. And I thought, I bet you that's Robert Coleman. And the old Michael would have just let him walk by. But I went to the mission secretary and I said, is that Dr. Coleman? And she said, yes. I went to Dr. Coleman. I said, Dr. Coleman, um, my name is Michael O. Maybe you know my sister, Tina. Um, I heard you have an advanced discipleship class um, here on Tuesday mornings. Um, if I come to Trinity, can I go to your advanced discipleship class? And he said, well, Michael, we, we normally don't let first-year students into, our, into my advanced discipleship group. Uh, but good fruit comes from good trees so you can join. And I was sold. I was sold on Trinity. I even actually started to recruit for Trinity before I even came here. Um, that summer, I was on the telephone with my wife's brother, um, who was serving in Morocco at the time. He had already committed to going to Westminster Theological Seminary, um, had already sent in his deposit, in fact. And in a moment of insanity, I said to him over the phone, I said, John, we're going to Trinity. Go with us. 
And then after a pause, he says to me, ask them to fax me an application. I can't recall if I ever got my referral money for bringing my brother-in-law here. Could someone check on that for me, please? Um, with interest, if possible. So when I was at Westminster talking about why I didn't go to Westminster Theological Seminary, I explained it like this. I said, Harvard recently introduced a new curriculum. It was the first major change in 30 years. And the rationale for the change was this, Harvard is too parochial. And simply put, my reason for not going to Westminster Theological Seminary, I told them this, was that Westminster is, or at least was, too parochial. For all the wonderful history, tremendous faculty, and theology, Westminster is, or at least was, uh, too parochial. So I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and found that uh, Trinity is, or at least was, too parochial. But I think less so than Westminster. Now, one thing I can say for sure with great respect and appreciation is that Westminster is not parochial in their mission statement, which is from Habakkuk 2.14, stating that Westminster exists to serve Christ and his kingdom by extending the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ until that knowledge covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. And I know that that is a conviction that is shared here at TED's. And I'm so thankful that many people who spend time here at TED's leave this place with a better understanding of the world and a bigger heart for the lost around the world. I still remember how incredibly encouraged and surprised I was when Trinity President Greg Waybright opened up our missions conference with the words, this is the most important week of the year for Trinity. I had such a wonderful experience here at TED's. I loved living in the apartments, uh, D apartments. I loved getting to know, especially the international students. I loved even 6 a.m. advanced discipleship with Clem Coleman, for which I would wake up at 5.52 and run from D apartments to the Torch Center. I remember also running with excitement through campus, not just for discipleship, but also when word got out that there was leftover Luminati's pizza after an admissions event. Um, I live in Japan currently with my family and uh, just really love spending time with Japanese alumni from TEDS. Um, I remember when they explained to me the difference between Japanese students at TEDS and Korean students at TEDS. They said, Michael, the Korean students at TEDS are the ones driving Japanese cars. And the Japanese students at TEDS, we are the ones driving Korean cars. And that might not be the case anymore. Um, I remember like it was yesterday being an advanced Greek exegesis class with Don Carson. Um, he had come in that morning. He announced that he had recently come back from Philadelphia, I think probably speaking at the PCRT uh, conference. And my brother-in-law and another classmate and I, we were all very proudly from Philadelphia. And we boldly and foolishly start calling out, yeah, Philadelphia, woohoo!" To which Dr. Carson replies, oh, really? Why don't we have the Philly boys lead us through our passage today? Be careful what you say in class. Uh, by the way, Dr. Carson was with me years later teaching at my seminary in Japan. Um, and I asked him while riding together 300 kilometers per hour on the bullet train to Tokyo, I said, may I call you Don? To which he graciously replied, well, I can't very well say no now that you've asked me, can I? with a smile. Uh, Don's friendship and mentoring have been such a tremendous blessing in my life, and I so admire his humility and graciousness. Um, I don't think even I would have accepted an invitation to come teach a course at my own tiny seminary in those early years of our existence. I'm thankful that Dr. Carson is not here this morning. <laughs> Uh, most of you 
probably never had the tremendous privilege of sitting under the teaching of Paul Hebert, our beloved missions professor who is now with the Lord. I used to say that just to hear his five-minute Bible meditations at the beginning of class was worth our whole year's tuition. But despite Paul Hebert and a wonderful missions faculty, I still came to be pretty disappointed in my early weeks here at TED's in the lack of vision for world missions. I remember complaining to my brother-in-law, John, about it, and, and basically the Lord threw back at us the challenge of, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to just complain, or are you going to do something about it? So I ended up hijacking Trinity Mission Fellowship, uh, TMF at the time. Um, I told my other uh, brother-in-law, Scott, one day um, that I felt that God was calling me to take over leadership of the fellowship. And dazed and confused, uh, he agreed. We ended up hijacking Monday Chapel as well. Uh, back then, we had chapel, I think, I think it was four days a week. And I went to Dr. Waybright, and I said, you know, we have a lot of chapels. How about giving us Monday chapel to devote to prayer for the nations? Dazed and confused, he agreed. And it was actually in this very room that I received my calling to Japan. Uh, after a time of uh, worship and a testimony or mission challenge uh, on global day prayer, uh, um, global prayer hour, um, we would break out into prayer groups and we would pray for different nations or regions of the world throughout this chapel. Um, at the time, I was considering China or Japan as a mission field, and, 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 and right out in this whole section here, we had our prayer group for China. Sometimes we had 50, 60 people who were praying just for China in this area. I remember a French student, Joël de Benoit, praying along with many Chinese and Chinese-American students, praying for China in perfect Mandarin. At least it sounded perfect to me. And up here in this little corner of the room, up right here, were two or three of these pitiful Korean car-driving Japanese students. And they said, you all go to China? And we'll go to Japan. We'll go to Japan. During my time here at TED's, I came to believe and challenge also my fellow students that these days studying at seminary are not just important, but could actually be the most fruitful days of my ministry life. Not because I was doing a particularly impacting ministry at the time, I really wasn't, and not because I foresaw um, having a particularly impacting ministry in the future. I thought and hoped that perhaps one day the Lord might use my life to impact five or 10,000 people in the future. But I realized that it was here at seminary where I had the opportunity to impact 800 people who each might one day impact five or 10,000 people in the world. That's 8 million people. Brothers and sisters, these days could be the most impacting years of your life. Hebrews tell, 10 tells us that we, we must consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some seminarians but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Enjoy your classes. Enjoy your classes, but do not, please do not miss out on the grand opportunity of influencing and being influenced by your classmates, especially those from outside of the U.S. Our international students are incredible gifts from God and from the global church to you. If you leave TEDs without having at least one good friend from outside of the U.S., I, I would tell you, you've been foolish. Um, I must confess that I was completely surprised to hear from Dr. Dockery about being chosen as TEDs alumnus of the year. Um, I want to say thank you for such a surprising and undeserved expression of grace. But God knows, God knows that there are many, many, many more worthy alumni than myself, even from my class alone. 
Um, I can think of classmates um, who made an impact in my life who are making impact around the world. My good friend Ale Musheta from Ethiopia, Eiko Takamizawa in Japan, and my friend uh, Jeff De Lucien, who is currently running for the presidency of Haiti. I ask that you would pray for Jephthah and for the elections that will take place on October 25th. Um, I wrote to Dr. Dockery. I said, my history in missions has been brief and marked by more than the average share of mistakes and shortcomings. Uh, in all honesty, I consider myself among the least of the missionaries serving around the world. Though I am thankful that despite my transition to serving the Lausanne movement, I am able to retain my seat among these wonderful friends as a fellow missionary. Uh, one of the first questions that was asked of me by some of the Lausanne board members was, uh, when are you moving? In other words, when are you moving to America? And I told them, I'm not. Lausanne is moving to Japan. Uh, when I first spoke at Westminster, I was president of our seminary in Japan. Uh, in fact, when I attended my first Lausanne event in 2004, um, I was a 33-year-old president of a seminary that didn't yet exist. I had no business being there. And I have no doubt that my serving as president of a seminary itself was utterly humorous to God. Uh, you might be wondering, how do you become a seminary president in your early 30s? Uh, Brian Chappell and I have had some wonderful conversations about this and also about ministry and life in general. Um, I guess that how, how you become a seminary president in your early 30s is something about which some seminary students might have a keen interest in learning. Uh, occupational advancement and executive leadership are the hallmarks of success in our society. And although the attainment of such goals is clearly not the definition of success, according to Christ, um, I would dare say that these are temptations that typically face your average seminary student, or shall we say, above average. I still remember my first week here at TED's, um, talking with the other students during orientation. Uh, several of my classmates, who hadn't even yet experienced the day of seminary, when I asked them about their ministry goals, answered without hesitation, oh, I'm going to get my PhD and be a seminary professor. Upon further conversation, I think you know, half of them went to Wheaton or another Christian college and, and probably went to a Christian high school, Christian middle school, Christian elementary school, and, and no doubt a Christian daycare. And I guess that you know, maybe half of them didn't have non-Christian friends. So I found it really difficult to understand these students. Um, I had just come from teaching in the public schools in the Philadelphia area um, one year at what was voted as the most violent school in the city. If you saw blood on the floor, you would ask someone, guys or girls? Um, it was the girls' fights that were the most nasty and bloody. Uh, but I loved my students. I actually have a confession to make. Uh, three times as a teacher, I got called into the principal's office. Once for wearing a cross, uh, once for helping Christian students to start a Christian club, and once for having uh, the students read from John 1, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, after teaching about the Passover in a unit on world religions. Uh, for the first two times I was called into the principal's office, uh, I was only called into the principal's office one time as a student, just to let you know. Uh, for the first two times I was called in as a, as a teacher, um, I, I, I plopped down my 80-page senior thesis on the rights of Christians in the public schools on the principal's desk, and I, say, I, I said, Joe, if you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, the third issue, um, I actually at the time already knew that I was going to go to Trinity in the fall and was ready to submit my resignation. So he calls me into the principal's office, I'm in trouble. So I, and, and there's other, another teacher there as well. And I said to the principal, I said, I am perfectly within my rights to use primary sources from religious texts in the classroom. But if you want to fire me, go ahead and fire me. To which he said, oh, no, 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 no. There's no, there's no reason for that. Um, I was a pretty popular teacher. But it, it, it was still fun to say, if you want to fire me, fire me. 
So then to go to seminary and meet students fresh from Christian college who knew that they wanted to get PhDs and be a seminary professor kind of blew my mind. To me, for a young person like that, wanting to be a seminary professor before even a day of seminary was kind of like a, like a high school or college basketball star saying, oh man, I can't wait to coach. You don't want to be a coach. You want to play. You want to, you want to play ball. You can think about coaching after your knees blow out or you get so old that no one wants you anymore. With all due respect to the faculty of Trinity Evangelical <laughs> Divinity School. So years later, with great humor, God calls Michael O., who didn't even want to go to seminary, to be a seminary professor, a seminary president, no less, at the age of 33. So what I want to do with the rest of our brief time together is to answer two questions. And the first is this, how did this happen? Uh, now, the short answer is that 30 years ago, pastors in the Nagoya area of Japan started praying that God would provide a seminary to train young people up for gospel ministry. It was their idea, not mine. My wife and I served as MTW missionaries in 1998 and 1999, right after graduating from TEDS. Uh, during that time, I asked uh, many pastors and missionaries and Christians, you know, what, what does Japan need most? What would be the most effective way that we could serve the Japanese church and nation? And everyone gave the same answer. They said, we need to train young leaders. And this was especially true in a nation where there's only one quarter of 1% Christians, the second largest unreached people group in the world. So I asked more about what kind of theological training already existed in Japan. Geography, theology, pedagogy, and came to this conclusion that, well, if, if it's that important and strategic and desperately needed, and if, if no one else is willing to do it, then, then we'll do it. Knowing full well that there were hundreds and hundreds of people more experienced and better qualified to start a seminary than myself. There are probably dozens in this room alone. So we left Japan uh, to get further training and start preparations to establish a new seminary in Nagoya, Japan. And then finally, a last question for us all. Why should a teaching, training, or counseling ministry overseas be your first choice? Uh, probably many of you are praying and thinking about your future ministry after graduation, possibly to get a PhD and be a seminary professor, or to pastor in a church in the U.S., or serve as a counselor in the church or at a counseling center. Uh, probably many of you have made and will make decisions based on one or more of the following three factors. Number one, what you know. Many people make choices based entirely on and within the confines of what they know and have experienced. Uh, this can be a good thing. It can be very natural, but it can also be unnecessarily parochial. Uh, years ago, I was at a conference where a wonderful pastor was speaking about cultural engagement and contextualization in his city. It was great teaching, though not necessarily anything really new, just an application of missiological and anthropological principles in the context of the city. And during the question and answer time, I told him how much I appreciated his teaching, and I told him that... I was kind of waiting for him to extrapolate his focus and teaching from cultural engagement in a U.S. city, extrapolate it out to cultural and gospel engagement with the nations that can so beautifully flow from a powerful city ministry. And his answer was, well, this city is what I know, so that's what I talk about. I was talking with my friend Jason Mandrick, who is the editor of Operation World, um, a book that every single Christian should have. I always say to people, you just need two books, your Bible and Operation World. He admitted, Jason admitted, he said, there's not a lot of research on theological education globally, but one statistic that he mentioned to me was this. He said 99% of seminary graduates from U.S. institutions end up serving only in their own culture. Don't limit 
your decisions about the trajectory of your ministry based on the narrow scope of what you know. Instead, please purposefully expand the scope of your knowledge and experience and heart. And that easily starts with just making friends with some of the international students on campus and the hundreds of missionaries who pass through TEDs and the thousands of international students in Chicago. A second factor in decision-making about ministry is often this, influenced by a worldly mentality. I think this is a temptation, you know, to, to think the way the world does, seeking the biggest, most famous, most secure, most prestigious position. And if these are your standards, you will probably never consider the mission field and teaching or pastoring or counseling overseas, especially not in an unreached nation. Uh, at Christ Bible Seminary in our first year, we had three full-time students. Uh, by the second year, we had grown to two. I think that was actually when Dr. Carson came to teach Acts and Paul for us. I had to pay homeless people to come sit in on the class to lessen my embarrassment. But I am eternally grateful that he would accept an invitation to teach at our fledgling school. There was no prestige teaching at our tiny seminary. I am sure that Ted's did not announce to the public that he had just taught at Christ Bible Seminary. And though by God's grace, our seminary has seen significant, beautiful, blessed growth, there are no great prospects for professional advancement teaching at our seminary. There is no security teaching at our seminary, at least not worldly security. So if a $60,000 per year salary that you don't have to raise for yourself is a priority in your future ministry, I would say that you should not consider a teaching or training or counseling ministry overseas. But I would say that you should consider and ask yourself how it is that you believe that you have the right before God to set limitations or parameters in how you will or will not serve your king. And finally, a third factor in decision-making about ministry, uh, limited understanding about global circumstances and opportunities. If I were to ask you to raise your hand if you can explain what an unreached people group is or what the 1040 window is, how many of you would raise your hands? These are two critical global mission strategies that came out from the first Lausanne Congress and the second Lausanne Congress. In a typical church, I find that about 10 or 15 percent of the people know the 1040 window. It's my hope, it's my hope that parochialism and lack of heart for the global unreached in many U.S. churches and among many U.S. pastors is more due to ignorance than apathy. The 1040 window includes nations that are 10 degrees north latitude to 40 degrees north latitude, stretching in the east uh, from Japan through China and Southeast Asia, South Asia, and into the Middle East and North Africa. This fairly small window encompasses about, 40, uh, about 4 billion people. 95% of them have not heard the gospel. 90% of the world's poor lives here. The most persecuted nations in the world are here, where thousands of Christians are martyred each year. Less than 10% of the world's missionary force minister here. There is one missionary for every 150,000 Japanese, one missionary for every 500,000 Muslims. Less than $5 of every $100 of missions giving goes to the 1040 window. This reality demands the death of parochialism in the Western church. It demands the death of parochialism in the Western church. And no matter what seminary it might be, whether Westminster or Ted's or Christ Bible Seminary, I do believe that we should exist to serve Christ in his kingdom by extending the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ until the knowledge, that knowledge, covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. 
I have great admiration for so many seminaries here in America and around the world, such great admiration and respect in particular for this institution and this faculty and staff. Um, I acknowledge and give praise to God for all that has been done through TEDS and her graduates. But with great jealousy for the glory of God and with hunger for an even greater impact of this institution, I exhort all of you, do not rest. Do not rest until the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Do not rest. Don't be satisfied with the study of wonderful theology. Mobilize and be mobilized until that theology is known among the unreached, among the poor, among the oppressed. Don't be satisfied with engagement solely with your own culture, whether American or Presbyterian, Korean, evangelical free or African or whatever it might be. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes to the unreached billions in the world and step out of your own comfort zone and reject the idolatry of comfort and security. While the past years have seen a precipitous drop in the percentage of missionaries from America and the West, there has at the same time been an unprecedented response from the non-Western world or what we call these days the majority world. Uh, today we are approaching uh, the day when actually 70% of the world's missionaries are from the majority world. But there is still a critical need for missionaries from the West. There are still more than 6,500 unreached people groups in the world. And more than 3,000 people groups are completely unengaged. Also, and this is very much relevant to all of you, there is another key role that I believe that the West can still play today an extremely strategic and crucial ministry, and it includes the ministry of teaching and training. It, it seems more and more clear that Christians in the majority world have, have more passion for God, more zeal for evangelism, more willingness to sacrifice and suffer than we do. We have much to learn from them. But one particular area that an institution like TEDS can offer is, is godly, world-class, rock-solid theological training not only are particularly through the institution itself, but through its graduates, not merely Chinese or Africans returning to their own nations, but people of all backgrounds going to all nations. I have no doubt the graduates of many US seminaries have the excellence of training needed to be a blessing to the nations. But are we willing to go? For the 3,000 unengaged people groups in the world, it is not simply that there is no seminary for them. There is not a single mission organization or church that has targeted them for engagement. There are huge numbers of seminary graduates with PhDs in theology, biblical studies, etc., who are unemployed, who cannot get a teaching position at a seminary or a Christian College, thousands, thousands. Is your desire or sense of calling to teach in a seminary or train leaders or teach the Bible, is that stronger? Or is your insistence that it be in America or at a prestigious seminary or in a particular church or under particular circumstances stronger? And if you are going to help to do training for leaders overseas, I ask you, will you have the humility and faith to live among, serve, teach, and suffer alongside of our dear brothers and sisters among the nations? We have a role to play, but I want you to know that the global church is growing cynical toward the church in the West. They hear us say that we want to be the teachers and trainers of the nations. But we lose our credibility when they see our lifestyle. A lifestyle of comfort, parochialism, pride, and security. They hear us say that we want the knowledge of the glory of God to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But they see a nation where 99% of seminary grads serve their own culture and enter into cutthroat competition by the thousands to get hired for a single prestigious professorship or pastorate. 
Uh, today in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and other places around the world, there's been tremendous response to the gospel. The danger, however, is that there are so many Christians who are led by so few leaders, many of whom have little or no theological training. This has resulted in a large number of cult groups emerging from the church in places like China. China is extremely exciting, but also extremely precarious if her leaders, if her leaders are not theologically trained. Now, a great encouragement is that there are a growing number of training centers in China and also Chinese leaders getting advanced theological training in places like TEDS. Now, not all of you are called to go overseas. I want you to know that. I don't believe that all of you are called. A lot of you are, though. But we all, all of us, every single one of us, must give the Great Commission and the mission mandate throughout the entire Bible more than just lip service, more than just one Sunday out of the year in your churches, and more than a one-week mission trip. Some of you, God is calling uh, to, to stay and, and, and minister here in the U.S., and I would say, if you stay, if God is calling you to stay, then stay and mobilize and send a hundred to the mission field in your place. And for some of you, you're, you're unsure about your futures. You're unsure. And first of all, I would ask and hope that every single one of us would pray from the heart, Lord, I would go anywhere for you. Lord, I would do anything anything for you. Guide me for your glory. And that is just a basic prayer of lordship. And then I would ask you to think about three things, just three things that I have used to guide my own life. So thinking about the Bible and God's wor world, thinking about the Bible and God's world, what is the most strategic ministry I could possibly do? Second, what is the most strategic and needy place to do that most strategic ministry? And thirdly, what is the most strategic and excellent and God-honoring way to do that ministry? Um, those three questions have guided some of the most important decisions in my life. Uh, to the TEDS faculty and staff and leadership, I urge you, uh, be good stewards of the opportunity that you have with your students, your precious students. Teach them the whole counsel of God that aims to impact the whole world so that every tribe, language, people, and nation might bow before our God. Uh, there are so many ways that each of you are seeking to serve the global church, and I thank you. I thank you. But I ask that you do even more. As you counsel students about their future ministry, would you please consider the reality of the global church and global missions and counsel them? Would you be an even more visible, even more globally minded and hearted example to your students that their aspirations from watching you and your ministry would not be merely academic and intellectual, but spiritual, global, and missional? And would you even consider both professors and students giving a tithe, a tithe of your ministry life, say three or four years, to teaching in a seminary in the 1040 window, to train the least trained, to minister among the most unreached and the most persecuted Christians in the world. Again, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your ministry here at TEDS. Thank you all for your patience and graciousness uh, with my words and with me. Um, thank you for the profound influence that so many of you have had on, on my life. Um, thank you, Dr. Dockery. Thank you so much. And thank you, all of you. Thank you, all of you, for how you will spend the rest of your short days to serve Christ and his kingdom by extending the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ until that knowledge covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let's pray. Glorious and gracious and global God, 
we bow before you. You are the king. You are the Lord of lords. You are high and exalted. You are worthy. You alone are worthy. We worship you and we bow before you. And we just lay our lives down at your feet, Lord, and ask that you would do whatever you desire, whatever would be pleasing to you, however you would use our lives, Lord. May we throw out our own plan A or B or C, D, E, so that we can get to and be open to however you would lead us, however you might use us, Lord. Forgive us for our parochialism. Forgive us for our paternalism. Forgive us for our pride, O oh God. We just bow before you in repentance and confess, O oh Lord, our imperfect willingness before you, Lord, to be used by you for your glory alone. So I pray your blessing, O oh God, upon everyone in this room, O oh Lord. I pray your blessing the blessing of your guidance, the blessing of your conviction, the blessing of your teaching, and the blessing of your spirit to empower our feeble efforts toward your great and eternal global glory. Use my brothers and sisters for your glory, and thank you for this precious time together. In Jesus' name, amen.